Hi, this is Ben Kissling, and this is episode 13 of my video series on William Lane Craig and Genesis. We've been going over uh, Craig's video and lecture series called Defenders 3, Excursus on Creation of Life and Biological Diversity. Um, but there's been a little new developments. His book has come out called In Quest of the Historical Atom, which I've read. And also, last week, Myself and our special guest today, Leonard Kraft. Hi, Leonard. Howdy, howdy. Uh, we both attended this uh, class at Houston Baptist University online. We both audited it, so we're not students. We didn't take it for credit. Um, but it was really fun, and we spent uh, two and a half hours in the class, two of which uh, Craig was there in person. Uh, he went through a very short. Um, uh, version of his book, and it was really fun. And I met Leonard, and we hit it off and decided to do an episode together. So, uh, Leonard, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And also, don't forget about your gaming channel. <laughs> well, uh, my name's uh, Leonard Kraft. Um, I've been a Christian now since I was uh, 13 years old. Um, and uh, growing up uh, in the Lord, I had a lot of questions that um, William Lane Craig actually was influential on me in providing answers, um, giving reasons to think what I, uh, like giving arguments for Jesus' resurrection and for the existence of God. Stuff like that was super appealing to me uh, for someone who was really looking to engage intellectually with some of these issues, um, especially as a, as a young Christian in the faith. Uh, and so William Lane Craig was a big influence on me. Um, his work on origins is something that's um, secondary to me. Um, it's neat. Uh, it's not uh, his material that I normally look out for, but um, I was originally going to go see him in person in March of 2020. He was going to be over in Missouri, and I'm uh, within driving distance of uh, the area he was going to be at, but of course COVID happened. Uh, and since then, he hasn't been too inclined to uh, take physical appearances to go anywhere, so I thought, well, you know, if I want a chance to interact with Dr. Craig, I, I better <laughs> take the chances where I can. So I decided to audit the historical Adam class, uh, bought the book. Uh, I was familiar with his material from his Defenders lectures, but um, overall, I'd say that the, the class, I, I learned a decent bit from it. Um, and it was exciting to, like, for me, for me, this is all kind of exciting. Um, I, I, I enjoy <laughs> this kind of stuff. It's, it's super intriguing to me. Um, and I, I learned a lot. Uh, just to mention, as well as Ben said, um, I do uh, Pokemon stuff. I travel around to different uh, tournaments, uh, well, when they happen without COVID anyway. Um, and so I enjoy doing, uh, uh, researching the depths of the Pokemon games. Um, I am a programmer by trade. Um, I have a bachelor's in computer science, so that's what I focus on. And uh, it's, it's fun for me to apply those skills here. So I am not a theologian by any, in any sense of the word. Um, and so I'm just a layman here. Uh, but I, I think Ben and I both say that this class was definitely interesting to learn and interact directly with Dr. Craig. Okay, cool. And, and where are you located right now, living? Yeah, so I live in Illinois. Um, not in the Chicago part, but in the not Chicago part. Uh, so <laughs> about the rest of Illinois there. Um, and I've uh, grown up and lived there all my life. I went to school in Missouri, uh, got my bachelor's over there, but um, I'm currently working over in Illinois at a college. I do um, IT work for them. Okay, cool. Yeah, I also grew up in the Midwest in Nebraska, um, so that was uh, probably part of the reason why we get along. Um, I just remember from the class, uh, <laughs> I, your screen was usually on my first, like, page of people on the class because it was a zoom class mm -hmm. and so it just seemed like whenever i was looking at your screen you're always you always had this huge smile on your face like <laughs> like i said you was like a kid in a candy store you were just having a lot of fun so i really yeah. i really enjoyed that yeah well sometimes um some of the stuff that dr craig did or said like sometimes i would just imagine situations in my head uh and that would just cause me a smile like i remember one time didn't he get up all excited um, yeah. He was going to go get his book on the Schrodinger Spears or, or whatever. Um, and we all were, were typing in the chat, like, oh, is he going to bring back a spear? <laughs> like, did he, did he get one of those German spears? Um, we, uh, 
as well, uh, I remember when he was talking about the cave paintings, he was like, maybe, you know, it's a good thing we're not grading you based on how well you can, you know, draw, draw one of uh, these. Uh, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder if he would, you know, if the final exam for the people who are taking the class for credit, uh, they'd have to draw cave paintings and they'd have to practice <laughs> throwing these uh, Schrodinger spears and I don't know, er everything else, but, you know, actually writing an essay or whatever they had to do for the final exam. Um, <laughs> So, so some of those, you know, just imagining those make me smile. But also, I mean, some of this stuff is really interesting to me. Uh, and so it's, it's just, it's, it is exciting learning about it. Yeah, so uh, just for me and Dr. Craig, like I, I probably am not as big a fan of him as you are. And because mm -hmm. uh, for me, um, not that I don't like him or anything. I've obviously, I've watched some of his debates and everything. And I was like, yeah, you go, dude. And but for me, like I grew up really focused on the origins issue, and so this is kind of my thing. Um, but and so Dr. Craig is kind of a step along the way for me. Um, but as I said before, um, the cr the class was two and a half hours, five days last week on Zoom, and it was hosted by Professor David Baggett, also at Houston Baptist University. And there was actually an interesting article that came out like last Wednesday um, about the Rosho Christie chapter at my alma mater, the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where I got a biochemistry degree. And they are suing the university because they applied for student funds for a speaker last year, Robert Audi, a philosopher, who, by the way, like he actually he's really important he's a uh, author of a textbook that i've had assigned for a class before in metaphysics and epistemology and this february professor baggett who hosted this class uh is going to be speaking at the unl chapter of racho christi and they are going to apply again for student uh for funds from the student uh for the from the student fees that go to student organizations so while they're suing the university for denying them funds <laughs> mm. so there was a little bit in the news there last week um so i thought i'd start out with uh, asking you leonard about your point of view going into the class i know you said that you kind of grew up young earth creationist but you lean mm -hmm. more old earth now uh do you have any comment on that Sure. Um, so I'd say uh, when I grew up, uh, Young Earth was the view uh, that was just traditionally put out. Um, I think it was mostly, uh, and just just from my perspective, I think it was just the easiest one to understand. Um, and especially it was uh, really taught to me and some of my peers at my church about the time when we would have been learning about evolutionary theory in uh, science class. Uh, so that would have been like sixth or seventh grade around that time ish uh, maybe a little bit earlier and a little bit later too um, we we uh, were really pressed um, I, I remember I think my youth minister meant well but um, they were uh, quite uh, insistent um, that you know just just basically deny whatever you hear in class um, that's contrary to the word of God um, you you can't believe this uh, and so I was like okay um, and I, I didn't really think too much of it um, as I was as I was going through class. Um, I I uh, tried to do as well as I could in school, so I was happy to just adopt a sort of framework in school where I'd say, you know, you know, in the system of school, you know, I want to understand this best I can uh, so I can do well on tests. But um, I'd say I, I wouldn't have to necessarily believe that. I remember as I was uh, continuing on in my faith, um, I continued to, I, I looked at uh, the origins just a little bit more. Um, this was, I think, a little bit before I started getting into Dr. Craig's material. I remember uh, this was about in, I'd say, my freshman year of college. Um, I was taking astronomy classes, and it was super cool learning about how, uh, I remember uh, starlight. Starlight was a, was a, was a big one, um, and how um, light from stars reaches us, and it was like, you know, it's such and such years old. I remember at the time I was like, well, what the heck? That doesn't seem right. I mean, that's as I, as I'm reading and understanding material, that just seems commonplace that you could have, you know, maybe a star, you know, never mind a few billion years away, um, but billion light years away, I should say. 
Um, but it's just a few thousand. I mean, if you just say like 20,000, that's going to be enough. Um, that's going to put you well beyond what I think you can reasonably say from a younger perspective. Um, and that was, that was a challenge for me. And so um, I was like, ah, you know, um, I would be open to an old earth interpretation. Um, I remember I had done some research on this um, at the time uh, with answers in Genesis. That was my, that was my big go-to uh, reference that I knew for um, young earth material. I had uh, attended the creation museum once, and that was super cool to be able to try. Oh my goodness, the creation museum is really, really cool as a museum. The one in Kentucky? Uh, yeah, the one in Kentucky. I've been there twice, and I've seen uh, the Noah's Ark exhibit once. So I've, I've been there physically in person. The Noah's Ark visit I did was back in, oh, was that in 17 or 18? Um, but it was, you know, comparably recent. Um, and so um, I remember, but I remember with regard to the starlight issue, I remember uh, reading on it at the time, and it was, um, and it was, I remember, I remember uh, it was, it was more or less saying that uh, God could have created the starlight in his time, and it just appears to us. It just appears to us as if it's this old, but in fact, it has not really taken this much time to travel. It just appears as if it's that old. And I'm like, well, was that, was that what AIG was teaching at the time? It was yes. Oh and wow! At the time, okay. I know I was. I I remember I was reading that, and I didn't. It just didn't seem very convincing to me uh, uh, not, because that I, wouldn't wouldn't be to me either. <laughs> yeah, um, and so that uh, let me think a little bit more, especially once I got into uh, WLC's work on the Kalam cosmological argument, and he and also the teleological argument he uses, where he depends on material um, from the Big Bang. Um, which I would typically, I, I would, um, when I was growing up, I was taught that, you know, the Big Bang is just completely antithetical to what the Bible teaches. Um, and then Dr. Craig was using this material. And um, I was like, okay, I'm willing to accept that, you know, if, if you grant these things, then we can still put these arguments to go through to think God exists. And I think over time, I just kind of um, dropped the, um, like the, if, if the Big Bang and such is true, if evolution is true, then these things could happen. And I just kind of started tacitly assuming them, which is probably not very, um, <laughs> very convincing. Um, I really liked what you said in, in class, Ben, of just uh, Googling ICR and then like a topic um, and then searching up stuff like that. So actually, the first thing I did once you had said that was I, I looked up ICR um, uh, and then Light from Stars. Uh, I found some articles <laughs> on that. I was, I was reading through it. I am very open to um, either interpretation. Uh, like I say, for me, this is a, a relatively secondary issue. Um, so mostly when I was taking the class, um, I, was, I would say that I'm most interested in learning what Dr. Craig's view is on it. There are a lot of things in Dr. Craig's book here um, that I like. There's a few things that I don't like. Um, and so the things that I like and the things that I don't like, putting those two together um, is... Part of the reason why I was taking the class, uh, and then, like I say, part of the reason was just to have any interaction with Dr. Craig at all. Um, but that's that's my perspective. So I would say I grew up young Earth. Um, I tend towards old Earth, mostly not because I have a very good argument for it. I think I think you can. I I, I don't really think you can you can rule out young Earth based on the science, and I think that's what Dr. Craig does. I think he just kind of assumes that there's no plausible scientific model for the young earth. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I think you could make one. I, I, I don't see any reason you couldn't make one. But I, I would just be open to either one. Okay, well, hey, that's what attracted me to you. I, I really like that attitude. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to try to be super pushy or anything. Um, but just uh, give a personal background for me. I, I hear the same story a lot from people who uh, grew up young earth and then sort of moved away from it. Uh, generally, I don't know if this is accurately what you meant, but I heard at the very beginning, you were like, you had some authority figures tell you, you know, just believe it because I said so and yes. reject anything that goes against the Bible. I hear that all the time. And I had a different experience growing up. Um, my dad was a, a medical doctor 
And my mom, so he postgraduate education in science, and my mom had a, a college degree in marine biology. So my parents were pretty, um, you know, they were smart people. Mm-hmm. And whenever I had tough questions, I, I, I try to think if there was any time I ever had uh, my dad or someone else at church tell me something like that, and I cannot think of a single time. My dad always had an answer for a question that I had. And even if it was a bad answer, he would give me an actual answer and not mm-hmm. just like use authority. And um, and so was, he he erred on the side of making stuff up in the moment a little bit, um, but mm-hmm. <laughs> but more more often than not, he would he would have he actually knew what he was talking about, and he would often give me a book, like and so. After a while, I learned to stop asking him questions because, <laughs> and I just learned to look up stuff on my, my own because I knew he was just going to throw a book at me. And uh, one of the books he threw at me was Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe, which I've I'm sure, yeah, everybody's heard of that one. And that inspired me to study biochemistry in college. Um, I was fascinated by it. And by biochemistry, not even just the intelligent design argument, but all the stuff that he was talking about. Like before I read that book, I thought that um, when you get cut and your blood comes out and it forms a scab, like I just thought the water was evaporating out of it and it was drying up like, you know, mud drying in, drying in the sun. You know, that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. And I read about the blood cascade in that book and I was like, wow, this is so complex. I cannot. I just had to learn more about it. So I'm kind of a biochemistry nerd uh, in that. And so I've never, when I went to college, I never really, because I, I had been taught so well my, by my dad, I never really ran into um, anything that I thought was something that I couldn't answer, you know? And mm-hmm. like, there wasn't a lot of pushback from people in college, which really surprised me. You know, I had been raised to think that, you know, atheists are the big bad boogeyman and they're mm-hmm. all going to try and convert you. But I really didn't experience that in college Neither at all. I. Yeah. And so, um, and even in science classes, like rarely was there anything about evolution. Um, you know, I can point you to a few places, like there's one place in my genetics textbook that I looked at and but I mean, I remember I was taking a genetics class for honors credit, and we had a small group of honors students. And there was the professor gave us several books to choose from that we could read and discuss in the class. And I voted for a Richard Dawkins book. I think it was The Selfish Gene. Nobody else voted for it. And I'm like, <laughs> come on, this is the only topic worth discussing, you know? <laughs> but nobody wanted to do it. So I, I just, you know, I had a, I had like one. I, I have a couple stories from college, um, might take too long, but with professors, but uh, one of them was in my philosophy of science class where I was kind of pressing her on her materialistic assumptions. And at one point she kind of just, she raised her voice a little bit at me in class and kind of was like, I, I was questioning basing everything on, on material, on matter right for your philosophy and she's like well what else would you suggest and i got kind of taken aback and i sort of muttered under my breath free will (laughs) because i was trying to find something that i might have in common with her because i knew Mm -hmm. it wouldn't be god right um and so you know that aspect of of craig's uh view i i like libertarian free will i've always Mm -hmm. liked that part um so for me, like I've never really moved away from young earth creationism, but I got super into intelligent design theory. And I, I remember I had some big arguments with my dad about it because, you know, AIG's position and Ken Ham is always, um, yeah, you know, intelligent design is terrible because, yep. because they don't lead to God and all the rest. And uh, I just think that that attitude is waning in young earth creationism um i know ken ham has been disinvited from some comp- some creationist conferences because of it um and you know my history with the young earth stuff is, is in in terms of the institution is i would say complicated 
Um, because I understand why they turn to independent institutions because they're being shut out of the regular ones, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it makes them become kind of insular and defensive and yeah. leads to some bad consequences. But I always thought that the Institute for Creation Research was the best source for, for you know, uh, credible, uh, competent arguments and evidence. Um, and so they put out a, a monthly, I think it is, magazine called Acts and Facts, which they just send out oh. for free. It's a nice um, color pamphlet, and it has like three or four articles in it by their scientists. They have 12 PhDs on staff. Um, so I'd really recommend that for anyone who's interested in it. Um, so why don't we move on to the next section and and talk about interacting with Craig, which I'm sure was your favorite part. We already we already talked about the spear thing. If that wasn't clear, it was uh, spears that were found, old ones that belonged to these ancient humans. Um, and Craig, my my interesting the interesting thing about Craig and this subject is he seems like super interested in ancient humans. Yeah, and. and like way more than I am, and he uh, like he's really interested in it. And he also he even did a whole speech during the class about how he feels very strongly that excluding these people from the human race is equivalent to racism. Yeah, and that he that's, this is how strongly he feels about it, and that if we do that, even with these people who are you know dead and gone. We're in danger of doing it today. And that was a really strong statement. I had picked that up from him before, but I don't think I really had heard him express that exactly before. Uh, have you heard him talk about that like I've that way him, before? I've seen him done it in interviews, and I've actually seen people criticize him for it. Um, I think very naively to say that, oh, if you don't agree with my view, you must be racist. Um, I've, I've, I've seen people characterize that but like that before, but I think what he's getting at is if these ancient humans, if you can demonstrate that they had modern human behavior and you say, and you just kind of shake your head and say, no, no, they're still not humans. Then, then he's saying that somebody who exhibits that sort of behavior today, you could still write them out today. And you could say, these people aren't humans if they don't exhibit enough cognitive capacity or something like that. And I'm like, you know what? I think you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very philosophical way of looking at it, right? Because you you put it in categories, mm -hmm. like, you, and so you have to get a definition of what counts as cognitively human, and then yep. own. it's sort of similar to the like an abortion type argument. It is where, really, yeah, where you're excluding people. So yeah, he feels really strong about that, and that was actually one of the things that I interacted with him briefly about. Um, and I said, I think I said something like, would you be willing to, uh, give credit to creation science mm -hmm. for a fulfilled prediction about these ancient humans being basically fully human? And he responded really positively to that. I was yeah. actually kind of taken aback. Like I, like the way he has characterized creation science in the past, I, I thought he would push back on that a little bit, like say, you know, well, are you sure you really predicted this or not? And I, But he was like, for him, that's, uh, he's like, yes. So that's more important, apparently, to him than, you know, the science stuff that he doesn't like. Yeah, I think so, too. He really focuses, I think. So um, I had actually watched him during Defenders 2, actually, on this. I don't know how much of his Defenders 2 material you've seen. But I in Defenders really, oh, I have really only watched the part that I'm doing this video series on. So, <laughs> okay. so That's... I'll, I'll, so in defenders two, so this is well before he started any of this work. Um, he talks at length about the population genetics problem. Um, he is really troubled by population genetics in defenders two. And in both dis in both in the book and even just the class, he just like breezed through it. Like, especially in the class, he's just like, yeah, this used to be a problem kind of thing. If you want, you can read it on your own. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just not bothered by it anymore. Um, and it's probably me, because of Swami Das. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, so I, um, I just a little bit on Swami Das. Like, 
Have you heard? Have you heard the part where Craig explains how he met Josh? I I don't know exactly how he met Josh. I think it was at um, a conference that they both went together. But I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, at this conference, I think it was John Bloom who was speaking. And I've heard several versions of this story on different oh. podcasts. I've watched a lot of William Lane podcasts over the last couple of, of years on uh, YouTube mm-hmm. podcast type things. And J- Swami Das stood up in the question and answer section and challenged, I guess, Professor Bloom, who's a professor at Biola University. He kind of started their intelligent design program, um, which I've taken that intelligent design class from him. It's actually it's it was actually better than I expected, um, but and Swami Das sort of did his whole thing where he challenges uh, intelligent design theorists on their claim that uh, they're dissenting from Darwinism, and he says that well, no one has been a Darwinist since the 1960s and neutral and the neutral theory of evolution, and Craig said he was really impressed by that, and like Swami Das is like willingness to stand up in a bunch of theologians and be the scientist in the room sort of <laughs> so <laughs> they've been friends like ever since i think but of course the big hang up for craig is he doesn't like swaminas's approach to the to the historical atom question because mm-hmm. he feels that excludes people from you know from being human yes so um but uh, yeah swaminas was going around telling people he was going to actually be the co-author of this book. Uh, yeah, he, I remember hearing that at the start, too, and then it, and then they parted ways. Yeah, and I least. think I'm pretty sure that was the reason, too, is, like, he, Craig wanted to write his own part of the book on that because he didn't want to exclude people the way he felt that Swamidas is. And, of course, Swamidas's thesis is that Everyone by the time of AD 1, so the time of Christ, everyone by that time would have been the genealogical descendant of Adam and Eve, right? Which is, that's kind of weird to think about. If there were people before that who weren't, I Mm -hmm. think that's what makes Craig uncomfortable. But um, So yeah, he has a lot of unpublished um, work from Swaminas in the book on population genetics. And, you know, so, so Swaminas is like, Swaminas programs computers, right? He's a computer programmer like you, I guess. And uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's similar. Yeah. And so he did, did a bunch of population genetics simulations and he had this big argument with Dennis Venema at mm-hmm. Biologos and Swaminas actually left Biologos as a result of that. Uh, argument because Venema was claiming there's no such thing as a historical atom. Genetics has proved it wrong, and Swaminas kind of basically got Venema and Biologos to change their mind on the issue. And I think that also sort of drew Craig and Swaminas together. So, what's your impression of Swaminas? I guess and Craig together. I, they they've spent a lot of time talking together in podcasts and stuff. Yeah, if you. Uh where Swami, Swami Das and Craig work together, usually in his popular level stuff, where, where Swami Das and Craig talk together, they don't really get too deep into like what the problem of population genetics is and how it's resolved. Swami Das just kind of does a more sweeping generalization of, yeah, the science doesn't rule this out. Um, yeah, the science yeah. doesn't say this. So he, he doesn't get too deep into things. So usually, um, Swami Das is also, he, he will press Craig... Uh, in ways that is kind of funny. Um, <laughs> That's another. <laughs> he'll thing make Craig a little that. squeamish um, sometimes, um, <laughs> which is which is which is fun to do. But he he does it in uh, in good faith. Um, but I mean, he's he, he's not a, a theologian. That's for sure. Um, but he's 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 a swell guy. Uh, I've actually I've thought about actually seeing if I could uh, email him and see if I could actually meet up with him. Since, like I say, I'm I'm in the uh, middle lower half of Illinois. Uh, so I'm not that far away from St. Louis. I probably could drive down and actually meet with him um, if I wanted to. So I've, I've thought about doing that just to just to say hello, but I don't know much what I would talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be a little weird. Um, what was I going to say? 
Oh, well, one thing I was going to say is they're both like rhetorical geniuses. Yes. That's another thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, let's let's talk a little bit more about the class. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what what were some key points of the class that you enjoyed, like uh, especially, you know, with interacting with him, which I know is why you took the class, like. What were some of the questions you asked him? I kind of forgot. <laughs> yeah, sure. A few that were uh, important to me. One of them that I had asked about um, was related to the documentary hypothesis. Um, he, kind of, he didn't talk about this too much. He skimmed over it mostly in his uh, book. Um, or not in his book, but in the lecture that he did. Um, so the documentary hypothesis, basically, for, for what I care about it, basically says that the book of Genesis and the Pentateuch in general was written a lot later than Moses. It was written well after, uh, potentially pre-exile, during the exile, or post-exile, some, sometime around there. And for me, I had a lot of problems with that, um, just for how, for how you could involve, like, because the material in Genesis, regardless of what, how you treat it, mytho-history or not, um, it's going to have, like, if there's a historical atom, then you need to have some sort of source to be able to get that to you. Either you have it going all the way back from Adam, or you have divine revelation. And divine revelation seems to me a lot more probable. So I had asked Craig, um, where does divine revelation fit into this? And he's like, well, there, there probably was divine revelation involved in here, and that's, what, and that's how a lot of this information came to be. And he's like, well, just remember that no matter how you get this information in here, the end product is still inspired. Um, and therefore it's going to be truthful and, and all that teaches and etc. And for me, I kind of knew that, like I kind of knew that's how uh, he treated biblical inspiration, but that kind of clicked to me um, where that was, that, that, was a, that was a big thing for me in, in figuring out, oh, wow. So like divine revel, I mean, even if, you know, God is preserving oral tradition all the way back to Adam or in some way giving direct dictation um, that's, Give it, that's providing the author with this information. Um, nevertheless, we can still say the end product is inspired. That was important for me. Another important question I had um, that I had thought about really early on, I mean, you talked about this a little bit at the end of the book, but how, how do you deal with Adam's contemporaries? Um, and I had asked whether or not Adam could have brothers and sisters that were not human. Um, um, and so they would be, I guess, I don't know if, if the technical term is hominin or hominid, but um, non-human brothers and sisters. And Craig was like, yeah, yeah, you, you could have that on my view. And I was like, okay, that's just, that's kind of weird to me. <laughs> um, that, that, that part was, is almost the most weird of, of everything that I, that I can think of. But um, those, those are a couple of questions that I remember asking that were, that stood out to me. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, the brother sister thing that, you know, cause he's picking them out of an existing population and making sort of making them human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and that kind of, actually, I just thought of that something like, couldn't God have just made the whole population human? I mean, if he's yeah. just making them all, making just sort of arbitrarily picking two of them, that seemed yeah. kind of weird to me. But that, but that's based on his commitments, his biblical commitments about Adam and Eve being the sole progenitors and all that. Yeah. So. Well, he also he mentions that. Uh, you know, uh, one potential possibility would be that there is a mutation in the parents of Adam um, that uh, brought about uh, the necessary cognitive behavior or like the, the necessary conditions for God to put a soul in in Adam and Eve. Um, yeah. So he, he's saying that maybe that happened divinely inspired. But to me, I, I don't or not inspired, but divinely caused. But to me, that almost seems like. I don't see how that's any easier. If you're just going to say it's like, you know, a divine mutation, why don't you just say Adam and Eve were created de novo at that point? Like, there's, there's not yeah. much difference in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think there is for Craig because he tries, he wants to explain the, uh, our propensity to sin by our non-human ancestors. Um, and so Swamidas' view of de novo creation wouldn't work for that. Um, True. That that was the mutations thing was the last question I asked him on Friday, and I was actually kind of surprised by his answer. Uh, which so it's a good thing I asked the question, I guess. Um, but I kind of really that 
really understood what he's getting at now with the mutation thing. So in the book, he just, like you said, he describes these single point mutations that change, uh, you know, a protein that, that we see today in other animals to what it is in humans. And it turns out that if you put the changed, the, the changed one, the one that humans have into animals, it changes their brain development. And it, I'm not. I can't remember the details, but I think it increases the size of some part of the brain or something. Yeah, I remember something like that. Yeah. So, and like th that sort of thing, like a single point mutational change, uh, from an intelligent design perspective, anyway, that's the kind of thing that we that you intelligent design theorists would be like, yeah, that could happen because it's just a single point mutation. Like that's not hard to get at all. Is is what they would say. And one thing we didn't get to in the class was like the waiting time problem, um, which I don't know if you've, uh, there was a young earth creationist named John Sanford. He was a biochemistry professor at Cornell for quite a while, and he's published on the waiting time problem, and he's worked with intelligent design theorists on it. And uh, which, you know, I think Ann Gager, the Discovery Institute, has published on it too. Um, I, I think Behe and Snoke have published a, a paper on the waiting time problem, but basically it, it is involving population genetics and how long it would actually take under actual evolutionary models for a, a mutation like that first to appear in a population. And then after it first appears, when it first appears, it only appears in an individual. That's how the probabilities work. Uh, and but after it appears, it has to spread through the population over many generations based on differential reproduction. In other words, natural selection, right? And they just calculate how long it would take. And I think one of the, one of the papers concluded that a single point mutation would take 86 million years to spread through a, a hominid population. And I know Swamidas has accepted this as a legitimate problem for the theory um, Craig doesn't talk about it in the book, but that's one thing I might have, I had a list of like 40 questions that I wanted to ask him. I, oh, I'm sure you could have gone all day with Craig. Oh <laughs> man, no, like I had so much I wanted to ask him and I definitely challenged him quite a bit with the questions mm -hmm. that I asked, um, to the point where it, it, I think it caused a little bit of drama. Um, you, you, you were a little bit, um. Especially, I think it was the second day, really, yeah. where a lot of the students uh, kept grilling you um, on on different on different parts of like, oh, you know, what's what's your view on this? You know, how do you explain this? Don't don't you when you when you read the text, don't you just see this? And I'm like, come on, guys, this is not a Ben versus Dr. Craig class. <laughs> yeah, um, you so. you were you were defending me. I thought that was awesome. I, I was like, wow, that's really cool of him. But yeah. And I, I didn't, I didn't really, I mean, I, I wasn't really bothered by that. I was kind of surprisingly nervous in the class sometimes. I, I, yeah, I, I interact with people all the time on this issue and I don't usually get like that, but I could tell like my voice was wavering and stuff and I don't know why that happened, but I didn't, I enjoy that kind of thing. I actually wanted that, like, because I think there's a lot of people who just don't understand what creation science says and so they have all these questions that they think are like gotcha questions and don't realize that we've been thinking about this for decades like <laughs> so i i appreciated that that part because it gave me a chance to kind of answer some of those um i will but, say though now this this will be a little bit more critical i do i do think some of your questions were a little uh uh, I don't know. I don't know how. Uh, a little more gotcha to to Craig trying to get him to so say which one ones? thing. I, I want to hear. I don't. I I would just say uh, it's it sometimes felt like that. Um, and now this is I'm not. I don't have a hard and fast opinion one way or another on some of these. But I do. I do remember sometimes. Um, think, thinking like ah, you know that's that seems really harsh. Um, some some of the ways I'd have to go back. I haven't rewatched um, the. The lectures that they that they recorded, um, so I couldn't give you a specific example. Um, and then again, don't also forget that I was being very passive with my questions. I was I basically just asked and I said thank you. So 
keep keep that in <laughs> mind. From from my perspective, you know, I was I was being like I was like hands off. I was just like, you know, please answer my question, Doctor Craig. Uh, and you and you and you were and you and you were uh, much more forthcoming. Um, but I, I guess I guess I'd say that you just came off more forthcoming. That's 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 the way I would word it. Um, but it wasn't. I, I didn't think it was bad, and I didn't think Doctor Craig minded either. Although sometimes you had too many follow ups. Sometimes that that was one thing I think everyone was like, ah, keep going back and forth on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On Friday, Steve. He was the guy who who did get a little aggressive with me on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, he he kind of private messaged me while I was talking with Craig. He asked me, look, please ask your question about mutations. I'm interested in it. <laughs> yeah. Like right in the middle of the previous interaction. But yeah, yeah I felt I like too- I was. I did at times feel like I was trying, that I was dominating the, that like I was taking too much time and I felt a little bad about it, but. I don't know. I had so much to talk about. So the big theme that I was looking at was not so much trying to convince him of young earth creation. Cause I knew that was not going to happen. Right. What I was trying to get at was a, I feel that you have misrepresented creation science and you criticize it without knowing what our position is. And B the second major thing though, was I wanted to try and convince him of some of the things that he himself does in his own worldview uh, creation and worldview construction is very similar to what creation scientists do and young earth creationists do. Like the Lorentzian uh, physics, I think. I think that was one example you brought up. The what kind of physics? Uh, Lorentzian. uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lorentzian, yeah. And that's one thing I brought up. And I've talked about this... Or I can't remember if I have talked about this in the in the series, but yeah, the first question I asked on Monday was basically, you know, you, Doctor Craig, you reject the current scientific consensus on Einstein's interpretation of relativity and also quantum mechanics, which he doesn't talk about as much in his public speaking, but he definitely has said many times that he prefers the uh, deterministic interpretation mm-hmm. of quantum mechanics, which I don't know much about, but basically, yeah, basically he wants to get rid of random, the randomness interpretation of quantum mechanics so that there's no uh, actual uncaused events in, in nature is, is my understanding. So anyway, I kind of pressed him on that on Monday And I noted that when he was talking about the physicist that he's appealing to for his interpretations of both relativity and quantum mechanics, he called them a a bright or brilliant minority is what he called them. (laughs) But when he talks about creation science, he calls us, you know, mavericks was the word that he used. And also for Harold Arp, he talked a lot about on Friday is a a critic of the big bang theory uh, in astronomy. And one, one of the questions I had, the more aggressive questions I asked him on Friday was, um, you know, we're, you know, young earth creationists are discriminated against. Would you be willing to, you know, stand up for us on academic freedom grounds? And he, he basically punted on that question. He's like, I don't want to get into decisions about that. Yeah. Um, Which to me is, you know, the typical theistic evolution pos- position is they they do the same thing. They just kind of punt on it, and they and they just defer to science. But it's always a sort of wink, wink, nod, nod. We agree with it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, so that bothers me a little bit. Um, uh, on that topic, I kind of wanted to ask him about intelligent design, but I never got a chance um, because I don't know if you know this, but the president of Houston Baptist University right now, I think I think he's still there, is a guy named Sloan. And I want to say it's Robert Sloan. I should have looked this up. But he Sounds used familiar. To, yeah, he used to be the president of Baylor University. And he was the big one at Baylor who was defending William Dembski of intelligent mm-hmm. design fame while Dembski was there. And Dembski was eventually forced out. Sloan was eventually forced out of Baylor, which is supposed to be an evangelical university. And so, you know, there's a connection there. Like, I, I thought about afterwards, like, 
later that night, I, I, I wished I'd asked him about what he thinks about Sloan's, you know, getting forced out of Baylor because of his defensive intelligent design, but. Well, I do know with respect to intelligent design, I know he has debated um, Francisco Ayala on the question. I don't remember when he did this. It was a uh, while ago. It was it was a while back. I remember he he takes a um, positive view towards that, or at least I think he defends its plausibility in in that debate. So uh, that I know I know that's something he's he's advocated for in the past, and I think he's open to it. But I know as far as I know, I think he he prefers. He doesn't have any dogmatic views, but I think he prefers like a progressive creationist where he's like, everything kind of just works except God introduces different mutations or fiddles with things as as things go along. I think that's his his general view. Yeah, and that was why I was surprised by his answer to the mutations question. I kind of went round round about there because he he went a different way with that and then I kind of expected. So his reasoning for progressive creation, which is fully compatible with intelligent design. Um, My impression of his views on intelligent design have been that he was initially very enthusiastic and defending it like 10, 15 years ago. Um, But in recent years, maybe two to five years ago, he's been sort of backing off of that enthusiasm for it. And you can Mm -hmm. kind of see that in the Defenders 3 class. Yeah, you can. Where he kind of, he describes it in a very objective, sort of dispassionate third person way. Like these people are okay, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so but when he answered the mutations question, he liter he he said, I am defending a theistic evolution position. Which again, with Craig, you never know what his real position is, you know. You don't know if he, he if he meant he was defending it in the book only or his actual position. But so theistic evolutionists, at least most of the ones that I've discussed things with, absolutely reject any interventions at all. Mm-hmm. And Craig is was kind of trying to minimize the interventions that he was suggesting. So he would he what he said in my in the answer to my question was, I th- I think that basically that God would have intervened with a few, a small number of mutations in the history of humans, but not enough to interfere with the evolutionary paradigm is what he said. And so to me, I was I, like, I kind of understood what he was saying. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know what theistic evolutionists would say about that, whether they would accept that or not. And I remember, um, a long conversation on Swamidas's site called PeacefulScience.org on his forum, where he was having this very same discussion about the intervention of creating Adam and Eve, right? So that's definitely a mir- miracle and a divine in- intervention. And he was he was asking all of his atheist scientist buddies on the on this conversation, just give me this one miraculous intervention, Adam and Eve. Okay, and then after that, we won't we won't do any more interventions, and we'll see what happens scientifically after that. And that sounded like similar to what Craig was saying, like he want he wanted a couple of mutations that God does, like intervene in the natural order. But after that, he doesn't he doesn't want to he doesn't want to say God's intervening at all. And so I, I, I began, I wish, I wish I'd had time to process that more because I would have asked a follow-up question, like, why do you even want any mutations being directly, you know, direct miracles, basically, from God? And I'm wondering if his answer would be that it's required in order for God to be considered the creator of man. Oh, I think he I think he'd probably say no to that because I mean he would probably take a he's a Molinist, so he would affirm a really strong doctrine of divine providence. So he'd say like God set the world up in such a way, he's therefore he he can still be the creator of humanity, even if he sets in motion the mechanisms to actually create humanity. I think he could still be called the author of humanity. Oh, that's true. Uh, but again, if so, then why does why why does he suggest any mutations at all? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a thing. I'm not. Sh- I think maybe 
maybe it'd be more sympathetic. He's just saying it could be possible either way. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so if he if he removed all interventions, that would basically make him a theistic evolutionist at that point. Yeah. And in I know in the class, the Defenders Three class, uh, not this past week, he argued pretty strongly for progressive creation, mm -hmm. and he gave the evidence of the you know the Cambrian explosion. There's not enough. It, it's not plausible for that to be fully naturalistic, and so God would have to intervene with a an infusion of information there, and then at other points in evolutionary history. So he might just be taking this position just for the sake of the book. Um, maybe, 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 maybe he, what he's trying to do is is his. He said pretty clearly his, his target is people like Dennis Venema, people who yeah. don't accept the historical Adam, and maybe he's just trying to go as far as he can in their direction and then like suggest, well, maybe God caused one or two mutations, right? <laughs> to get them to accept that, you know, um, that, that might be what he's doing, but he probably personally believes in more interventions than that. So yeah. maybe, maybe that was the source of my confusion. I don't know. That, that, that's one of my in general, frustrations with apologetics in general like i know you you're more interested in the apologetics in general mm -hmm. stuff than than i have been um like you know i grew up reading like lee, lee strobel books my dad had me read those and so it's not so much that i'm against apologetics it's just i feel sometimes like th this is the illustration i give if I was an atheist and I walked up to two Christians who are arguing, I didn't know who they were. I just came in the middle of the conversation and let's say it's a presuppositionalist versus an evidentialist or something like mm -hmm. that. And I've, I've watched debates like this on YouTube. They're so, they're so like, they're so deep. And it's like, they're, they're, they're really like committed to this these positions and i'm like if i was an atheist and i came in on that and i was like started listening to it and i'd be like wow this is a really interesting conversation can i interject guys what are you arguing about and if they then both looked at me and said we're arguing about the best way to convert someone to christianity at that point i think i'd feel really disgusted with it and i'd walk away and be like well that was a letdown like i thought you guys were arguing about truth and epistemology and things that everybody cares about but i don't care about you converting me uh, and like i just feel like maybe especially with millennial the millennial generation my generation that has a huge like hugely sensitive bs meter that i i i just wonder if the mode of apologetics of arguing positions that you don't actually believe in to to try and convince somebody is going to work with millennials very well because we just see through that right away and we're like i want to know what you really believe man you know what i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah and so i would i mean i would i would say wholeheartedly that i think craig actually 100 percent will believe in for in the both premises that he puts out in the Kalam cosmological argument for sure the ones yeah. that he defends and I, to me, I, I think that both of those are true too. Uh, and so I would feel happy. Um, like I, I agree. With, I actually think both presuppositionalism and evidentialism would be wrong to say that you must presuppose God in order to come to a knowledge of God, or that the only way you can know God is by evidence and nothing else. I'd say you could have the Holy Spirit. I, I, I would be happy to go with Alvin Plantinga on that uh, mm -hmm. route, and you can say that you can know God personally immediately through through experiencing god himself um through the holy spirit so i would i would say you could do that i would say that um you can put forward arguments in order to make the uh belief of christianity um more plausibly true than false um so i think you could do that too um and so that kind of stuff um for me has been helpful with actually engaging with other people but i think overall over just just uh so uh, to get back to kind of your point about talking with people and they realize like, oh, this is really cool. I'm, I'm interested in learning more. For me, sometimes um, just having familiarity with some of those issues is enough to get people thinking because I think there's a big stereotype uh, that Christians are ignorant and have no idea what they're talking about. Um, they're just stupid fools. Uh, they, they live off in their own corner. They, they, they really don't know what they're doing. Um, 
Yeah. And, yeah. And now you know how young Earth creationists feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you guys have it even worse. Um, I think because because you guys are the ones who are targeted. It's like, oh, you you are all imbeciles or something like that, which is of course false. Um, and and sometimes people just seeing an like just an intelligent, calm response where they can where you can talk through some of this stuff. Sometimes for a lot of people, that's just all they need to have their hearts open to the gospel. Um, and uh, for my sake, um, in what I what I can apply from the historical Adam and Dr. Craig's teaching on it is, I can say for somebody who is who is having trouble with these issues, I could say, well, for me, I am um, open to both young Earth and old Earth views. Um, I can give you what I think are possible models um, on both sides um, that. Um, could offer explanations, but either way, no matter which way you take um, on the origins issue, um, I would say that whatever Genesis teaches is true um, and inspired by God, and I'd also say that it would not be a necessary condition in order to be a Christian to have a firm stance on whatever Genesis teaches. I think you need to um, uh, place Jesus as your Lord and Savior and commit your life to him, and, I, and, you know, believe in certain essential truths related to that, like God exists, Jesus rose from the dead, I am a sinner before God, and you believe those sorts of things. But the origins issue for me can be secondary, and um, if, you're, if you're stuck up on this, um, and this is a, a barrier for you to come to the Christian faith, then here's some honest answers that, as far as I can research, this is, this is, this is, what, I can, this is what I can tell you as legitimate options available to you. Uh, and so that that would be how I would want to try to apply this material, I suppose, in an apologetics con context. Yeah, and that's that that seems legit to me. And I, I definitely, you know, don't say that the origins issue is a is a essential issue of faith. I don't know hardly any young Earth creationists yeah. that do. Even Ken Ham doesn't say that. They have a statement on AIG about it, but. Um, we do definitely believe it's important. I yes, at where I'm at right now, I, I kind of I have two thoughts on it. One thought is that I feel pretty strongly that the abandonment of the traditional interpretation of the Bible was a major step on the way towards the decline of Christendom. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone has their <laughs> pet ideas about that so mm -hmm. it's hard to prove that sort of thing the other one is that i just feel also strongly that um you know we should pursue the truth as as a as a higher value than evangelism and what i mean by that is is sort of I, oh i was going to i was going to try to pose this in the discussion on friday and i couldn't get a word in edgewise because everyone was so excited to kind of finish out the class but mm -hmm. i wanted to pose a a thought experiment if i had a friend who is a non-believer and i had enough middle knowledge about him <laughs> <laughs> um that i knew for certain that if i if i told him a lie about something specific and he believed it then he would accept Ooh. christ and become a christian but if i told him the truth and he believed that then he wouldn't and he would go to hell. Should I lie or tell the truth? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's a hard one. I would say, um, I'd say we'd probably be obligated to tell the truth um, in that sense. And we would just trust the Holy Spirit to do what we can with that. Uh, because what we're saying there, as you, as you pointed out, this would be assuming we have the middle knowledge available to us. And I don't think we'd want to, you know, try to convince people of lies. I, I, we we want to be as honest and straightforward with people as we can. Yeah, and I, I that's my feeling too. But what about the uh the I was thinking about this, the counterexample is if the Nazis come to your house and ask you if you have Jews in your basement, do you lie and tell them they're not there? Well, that's a different <laughs> scenario though, right? <laughs> right. So it is, and I and I think it is we both have the same intuitions, but the question is why is it different? You're mm -hmm. right. Like and I, I the only thing I could come up with is um Biblically, it just seems to me that there are plenty of examples in Scripture where the prophets and apostles and Jesus himself were in a situation where they had to make some cho a choice similar to that. 
and they chose the truth. And the, the biggest example was John 6 for me. That I've, I've looked at that for a long time. Where it's where after... They leave for hard teachings. Yeah, they leave him. And because he... But the interesting thing is the lead up before... The day before that is the feeding of the 5,000. Right? And they... Or it's one of the feeding stories. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. And he, they, they come and they get this... They come out because they want to hear Jesus' message. Right? And then because they're all there and Jesus doesn't want them to go away, he feeds them so they can stay and hear more. But then the next day they come back and they're like, hey, Jesus, wink, wink, nod, nod, can you feed us again? <laughs> right? And so they're coming now for the wrong reason. And mm -hmm. so Jesus kind of basically says, no, instead you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And for a Jew, that is super offensive, right? Because you're not even supposed to touch dead bodies in, in Jewish law. You're not supposed to drink blood of even animals. They have to, if they eat meat at all, they have to drain the blood out of it. And this is a very personal thing for them because they had, they lived with their livestock and they understood this whole process. And he's telling them, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they got they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and and finally, they just say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And they leave. And I thought, I think to myself is like, if, if Jesus was a modern evangelical pastor, uh, would he be fired? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he, he could have just said, you know, Oh, you know, it was, it's just a metaphor. I didn't really mean it literally. Like, what I meant was, I want you to come and listen to me because of you, because you're interested in following me and being my disciples, not getting free a free lunch. But he never says that, and I that, that always kind of like, you know, he always doubled down on that sort of thing, even when it drove people away. Um. And I don't know. I, I think I think maybe modern evangelical culture has skewed a little bit too much towards the seeker sensitive stuff. But I don't know what that has to do with Craig. <laughs> no, hey, we're we're, we're kind of getting off topic. You want to um, talk about his uh, genre analysis? Because I don't think we've talked about that too much. Yeah, sure. So overall, one of the things that um, was new to me from the class, and also especially in the last uh, Regional Faith podcast they put out was that Craig affirms a literal Adam and Eve and various events of Genesis 1 through 11 independently of the New Testament. I was coming in thinking that the only real reason he accepted the, you know, the historicity of Adam and Eve is because of what the New Testament says on this. Um, and because there's, because, it's, because there's too much myth, basically, in Genesis 1 to 11. There's too much you can't really determine anything from it. But that's not his view at all. He, he, as far as I can tell, um, I think he would say pretty much every event happened there in some sort of, in some shape or form, um, and every person listed there was a real person. He would just say, "You can't really know too much about the details." And that that was new to me. I, I don't know if you got that, um, like if that's how you were taking him as well. I, I did in the class. I, I I admit I didn't pick that up as much from the book. Um, I thought. I was pretty much in the same boat. I thought I, I thought he was saying all along that, you know, we can't know what Genesis says, so we have to affirm the historical Adam from First uh, Corinthians fifteen and Romans five, and that's what I thought his basic position was. But in the class, he did seem. I remember he said something about, like he was affirming a historical Adam in Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, in the book, he clearly refers to. Adam in Genesis as the literary Adam and the Adam in, yeah. in, in the New Testament as a historical Adam. So I don't know. I know in the, I know in the book he says it's probably, it's, this is almost a direct quote. It's probably futile to know which yeah. elements are figurative or literal. Mm -hmm. So, but I think you're right. I think, I think in, I think he really does think that there is some historical elements Besides just the genealogy. Yeah, exactly. That's um, what I thought, too. He would just say, like, this, it's just the genealogies. I'm just like, that just doesn't make any... Like, why would, why would that be the historical component you would care about? Because, like, like if anything, that 
like in the grand scale of Genesis one to eleven, those those are not nearly as important as you know the 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 fall and the flood. I mean, those are way more important, relatively speaking. And he would still, I mean, even when we talked about, I think uh, when we were discussing the assertoric versus illustrative use of New Testament texts, and you brought up the example of Second uh, Peter three, which I was going to, but you beat me to it, um, <laughs> um, uh-huh. where. Where, yeah, yeah, well, I actually got that from your, um, when you were doing your episode reviewing the histor- in quest of the historical Adam, and you, t- you mentioned your argument from Second Peter 3, and I'm like, oh, you know what, I wonder what that is. And so then I, I go and read it, and I'm like, yeah, that looks kind of astrotoric to me. Um, and so I was going to ask that, and then you beat me to it. And Craig was like, yeah, that's probably one of the best, <laughs> best arguments you can, you can put forward in, in, into... Um, I, he didn't say specifically what for, I don't think, but um, he 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 was very sympathetic to um, your your point of Second Peter three, and I was just like, yeah, I mean, because that just reading it, it seems like Peter thinks that there was a a worldwide flood that destroyed everything, and that's why you can't be scoffing, you darn scoffers, because <laughs> about the end of the world, uh, about the day of the Lord, because. Uh, this can this happened back in the day, so it can happen again, no problem. Uh, and that was that was something that was uh, important for me to see. I also asked him. I had asked him about Hebrews eleven because that mentioned several characters. Oh, in that was you. History. Yeah, and about Hebrews eleven. Um, and I I had asked him because it, it contained stories uh, from Cain and Abel, Enoch, and Noah. I think those are the three patriarchs that are mentioned. In uh, Hebrews there's of- several more. I know Rahab is in there as well, but definitely Reference- Noah and Abraham. Yeah, well, Abraham's definitely. But even just within Genesis one to eleven, you've got people in there. Um, and I remember I was I was asking like as a legitimate question, like, is this? Do you take this astrotorically or illustratively for how these? Because I was reading through, and I was just like, I'm actually not sure what he would say on this. Um, and he he didn't really give a hard and firm answer. He said, well, depending on how you treat uh the start of the next chapter where it says because we have this large cloud of witnesses um mm. and so uh, he he didn't make a firm opinion on that but i was like if you if you read like for example in hebrews 11 as far as i know i think that's where we get the interpretation from enoch was taken to enoch was like like he didn't die I, I think that's where we get that from in, in Hebrews 11. I'd have to um, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, and I'm not seeing Enoch in there, but Abel is in there. Let me, so let me see. from Genesis 1 through 11, there's... Oh, no, no, he's there yeah, in verse it, 5. It, Enoch, five. yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, so he did not So that he would not death. see death, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, which is not in the Genesis narrative itself. It's It's something that the author of Hebrews is adding in addition. You're not... I mean, you can infer that from from genesis but it's not something directly and so i was wondering like you know is this is an illustrative loose is this like new revelation that he's getting you know stuff like that um and i was and so dr craig didn't quite give an answer to that but i I thought hebrews 11 would have been a a good example of that because it's not talking about adam directly but it is talking about a lot of these figures that are in genesis 1 to 11 yeah i think the problem in genesis 11 for craig's point of view is that is not so much like if it was just verse three through uh, seven, like he could say it's all illustrative pretty easily. But the problem is, is that the author goes on to talk yeah. about Abraham, Sarah. Uh, he talked about Abraham for a long time. Moses, Joshua. I think Joshua. It's all the same style by yeah. faith. Yep, this, yep. this patriarch did something, um, and then he, he, he lists summarizes. A, yeah, he lists a bunch of the judges, and so it's hard to say that there's a transition there when he stops talking about illustrative and starts talking about real people. Mm-hmm. So, well, I mean, for Dr. Craig, he would be okay with saying that, though, I think, because as far as I can tell, he would be fine with affirming a historical Enoch or affirming a historical Cain and Abel. Which are which are mentioned in Hebrews eleven because he would say that the people in Genesis one to eleven, just on the basis of Genesis one to eleven alone, really did exist. They re- they really were historical, and he would say that I think for everybody in there. And I, 
I, I got the impression from how he talked about the fall and how he talked about the flood as well that he would affirm some sort of event related to that. Um, and then he would just say the details are mythical. And I guess I don't, I don't think mythical is the right word, but they're mysterious. We, we can't know them. Um, and so that, that was something that was new, new for me to just, to just understand that Dr. Craig is saying that he thinks just based on, or at least what he's propounding or what he says he's propounding is that based on Genesis 1 to 11 alone, you're going to get a ton of stuff historically speaking, which to me, you'd think if that was the case, he would have brought that up because he lists like, what was it? 10, 10 points, 10, 10 theological points mm -hmm. that he says you can, you can bring out of it. Um, and he doesn't like explicitly say that he doesn't explicitly say that, um, that, you know, all these people, they, they really did exist. Um, but it's just that we can't know that, that much detail about them. Um, but, but that that seems to be his view. I, I I think I'm kind of going around in circles a little bit here. But. Yeah, I mean, like I think with Hebrews 11, he wouldn't have a problem with the actual people being there, like you said. But he would have an issue with the descriptions of what they did. Hmm. So it says like Noah saved his family with the ark and escaped the judgment of the whole world. And says Abel offered a sacrifice, and so it does. It does go into a little bit of detail about stories that are that are in Genesis one through eleven. Mm -hmm. um, so one theme again that I kind of didn't have time to get to, but I it, it was kind of tangential to a lot of my questions was the the interplay between science and the Bible. So. I think what I was really trying to argue for was a an, an acknowledgement that the hermeneutic that Craig is offering is weak compared to the young earth creationism hermeneutic. Um, and if so, doesn't that sort of at, at the very least make up for the creation science being weaker than Craig's understanding of science, and oh. so aren't they kind of at least equal? And I don't know if you know Jonathan McClatchy at all. Um, I don't. Okay, he's another apologist, but he's kind of written a series on this recently, a few months ago, and he actually made that case, like that we can actually accept that the young earth creation, or the traditional interpretation of Genesis is better than any of the old earth ones. But the, the cumulative evidence from science overwhelms that. That's so interesting. He, so he's a big, um, oh, what do you call it? Bayesian reasoner. Uh -huh. so, he, yep. he says, so he says that, you know, the probabilities of the old earth interpretation is low, but the probability of the old earth from science is very high, and cumulatively they outweigh the young earth view. And Craig yeah, I, is, go ahead. Okay, I would I would say like I I wouldn't be a big fan of that. Um, I think I had, I think it was in class discussion I had brought up. Okay, suppose you have two um, interpretations of Genesis one to eleven that you think are that have equal warrants. They you have about as good of arguments for each of them. So I don't think you're going to get a better one than Young Earth. I think that's probably the most plausible one. But let's say. For the sake of example, that mytho history was um, on the same level. Then, if you have these two that are about the same level, then I think you could use science as a tiebreaker, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, so I remember think that. that. Would yeah, I, I, I don't really. I'm not a big fan of saying that um, because, well, I, I guess what you'd say there is, like, if if the science was so well established, like, but it would have to be like super, super well established, I think, in order for that to. Because that's basically what you're saying is the science informs your biblical worldview. I, I think that's basically what you're saying, and that's concordism, and you don't want to do that. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't like that fellow's approach. I, 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 you'd have to un unless you could demonstrate that the science was really, really overwhelming. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that would be a significant factor um, in my view. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to kind of hit at was like i don't think the science is that overwhelming and even just 
not so much the specific examples, but just by the nature of science itself. And, you know, Craig is a scientific anti-realist. And so that's yes. one, one thing I didn't really get about his view that I think actually was clarified for me a little bit. I didn't get to ask the actual question, but I think he understood. And he said some things in his, just in his lecture on Friday, I think it was Friday, where he basically, I think his, so, so basically anti-realism says that scientific theories are not accurate representations of reality. They're just useful models to, mm -hmm. to uh, assimilate all the data, but we don't hold to them being re real. And his objection, to his, his treatment of young earth creation has always been, and this goes back years, I've even sent in a question of the week to, to Reasonable Faith on this, and I got a, a response from Tim Bayless. It wasn't chosen by Craig, but I got a private response by uh, another, I don't know if he's on staff at Reasonable Faith. He's some kind of PhD that handles questions that don't get picked, I guess. But he sent me, I, we, I went back and forth with him a couple times, and he basically said to me, long story short, Young Earth creationism entails the denial of the veridicality of our sense experience. Meaning, literally, if you're a Young Earth creationist, it's the same thing as denying what you see on the words on this page that you're reading right now. And That's I just too harsh. Feel, well, if, yeah, and I, I tried to push back on it a little bit, but he was pretty adamant about it, and I, I felt that's. Craig's view, because what Craig says is, um, if the young earth creationist hermeneutic of Genesis was was true, mm -hmm. then we'd be forced to change our doctrine of inspiration to accommodate the idea that Scripture teaches error. See, I and, don't. I don't like that. Um, that's what's one of the things I haven't really. That's that's one of the things I don't think I like about Dr. Craig's position here, because it seems to me that the obvious response would be, no matter how improbable the science, like no matter how well established the science is, we've we've got the biblical source of truth that we'd say is significantly more like it's 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 got to be true. So I I would be I, like I I don't like his like. I mean, this is, in, to be fair, not his actual view. He would just say this is a worst-case scenario that he doesn't think we have to attend to. But um, I, I don't like his, his view of saying that if there actually is a conflict between what modern science teaches and what the Bible teaches, then we have to give up the inspiration of the Bible or at least modify it to prevent it from teaching anything scientifically. And that's just that just seems to me really strange I, I don't know why you do it that way I, I don't know why you just say that the scientific stuff is just an error even if i don't know why it's an error it's got to be an error and so i'll just hold out until somebody figures it out I, I don't see why you wouldn't just do that rather than modify your your doctrine of inspiration but maybe that's just me yeah and that's what i didn't understand about his position because he's an anti-realist and and that that was that was one of the questions. Well, I didn't ask him a question about it, but he answered it this way on Wednesday, I think it was, mm -hmm. where I asked him the question about the Babylonian astronomical models, which were inconsistent with each other. And he was arguing that this is evidence that they were anti-realists, basically, that they didn't take those models to be an accurate representation of reality. And my question was, well, I ca I basically was trying to counter, and I was saying. We observe physicists today who are realists, and they they accept incongruous physical theories. So that's actually evidence that people who are realists about this stuff also are comfortable with incongruity, incongruous theories, and so that the existence of inconsistencies in in their in their um, you know their theories and myths in this context uh, is not proof that they don't believe they're they are real somehow and he he just countered and said but anti-realism is is the most reflective which he means yeah. best best position mm -hmm. and so i think he kind of realized what i was getting at somewhere in the week and on friday he he said something about when he he talked about science and he was saying he said something i would i need to go back and find this so i can get the wording 
but he said something to the effect of there are some scientific explanations or theories or demonstrations that are so well demonstrated that they are really unlikely to change in the future. He talked about that, I think, with respect to what Venema was saying about population genetics. Oh, so yeah, talked, okay. Yeah, so he was saying, like, Venema equates heliocentric certainty, that is, that the, that the Earth goes around the sun. Um, um, he was saying that Venema equates that with, um, or at least in the past, equated that with the evidence of population genetics ruling out a historical Adam and Eve. So I think that's what the context he was talking about it in. So he would disagree with that then, if that's the context. Does, yeah. So again, I would still have the question, why, why would, and that was my, that was the gist of the question I sent in, in uh, three years ago, 2018, that I was talking about was, why wouldn't you consider, you know, what you just said? Like, why wouldn't you consider the other possibility that the scientific theories are wrong? And Craig just does 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 not he he will not even consider that, at least from what he's written publicly. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I don't understand. Like, because from an anti, so if I was a, and I think I could actually say this that I that this is actually my position. Maybe is that let's say that the Big Bang cosmology is the best scientific theory that accommodates all the data, at least all the relevant data. But because I'm an anti-realist, I don't have to believe it's true, right? And so I'd, I'll just say the scientific theory is the best one, but it's probably false because I'm an anti-realist. And you can support that independently of any scriptural arguments. That's very sound yeah. in philosophy of science. Well, he does, and he does basically the same thing with, with evolutionary theory. I mean... He said, I, I mean, he talks about how it's like the only game in town, um, but then he'll go on to criticize and he says it can't account for such, such, such and such. Um, and, and, and he'll go to town on that. So, I mean, it's really similar. Yeah, but if that's the case, then why does he take that position against creation science? Yeah, I don't or, know. Or I, against young earth creationism in general? Because yeah, I, would, I would say, I think it's very fair. I think it's a very fair analysis to say that Craig just isn't isn't interested in interacting with the creation science. And I wonder as well if part of that is just because it's out of his league. Um, I mean, his, his area that he works in is cosmology, but he hasn't done research on that in like forever. I mean, I don't remember when he, when he wrote his work originally, but I know like his, his most recent stuff is like the um, Borgufalenkin theorem. Um, so, I mean, he's, he, he's not got a lot of um, training in that area. Uh, and so I just, I wonder if the reason he's just not interacting with some of that is just because he just, he just doesn't because that's not his area. And then he right. just kind of tacitly assumes it. And he really doesn't, obviously doesn't trust young earth creationists, even with scientific credentials. But um, still, even then, I would say the young earth creationist biblical hermeneutic is really what he's talking about. Cause he says, yes. if the biblical hermeneutic is true, then we have to do all this stuff. Like that's bad. Like accept scripture teaching error. And I, I just, even if you don't want to interact with creation science, just philosophically, that seems to me to be an alternative to say that the scientific theories are probably false and we were free to go with the young earth creationist hermeneutic of the Bible as, as the truth, if we want to. Um, I just don't see why he objects to that. But anyway, um, is there anything else we want to go ahead? I was going to say, I think, I think we're getting kind of into the verdict section of, of, yeah. our, of our final <laughs> thoughts. Um, um, overall, uh, for me, um, and I, I don't, you, you probably, um, in, in your work at, uh, Biola, you probably get this a little bit more, but for me, this was my first time interacting in a really serious, um, uh, I guess it's not really a theology class, but you know, a class of faith um, where it's very intellectually stimulating. Um, like if I had to do a two point hour, two point five hour class on, you know, algorithms <laughs> for computer <laughs> science, trust me, I would be, I would be bored as heck. But um, I was. O overall, um, I was. It was really over too engaged. soon. Yeah, 
yeah, that's how I felt about it. Like, I wish, I wish we had more time with it. Um, and so, to me, this was, this was really fun um, and engaging. Um, for, like, it's, like I say, for me, since this is somewhat of a secondary issue, um, I get to have a little bit of fun exploring with, with, what, with what options I've got available to me. Um, I'd say that, like, I, like, I, like we were talking about there at the end, I don't like what he, how he describes some of the worst-case scenario stuff. Overall, it, do I think his mytho-history interpretation and his identification of Adam as Hildwurgensis is correct? I don't know. Um, I, I, like, since I, since I am a WLC fan, I wouldn't be opposed <laughs> to saying yes. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm, I want to agree with my hero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Basically, that that's that would be probably my best reason for agreeing it because, like, I like I like Doctor Craig in so many of these other areas. So he's probably right here, but that's not obviously a good reason. Um, so overall, I I am just tentatively uh, saying that to me this seems like the best alternative to Young Earth creationism. I, I think I think I can say that pretty confidently. I've never seen a view like I remember some stuff like you know like they say they take the days to be ages or something like that. That's just wildly implausible. Um, like there's like all the other views that like Walton stuff. Um, I remember Craig talked about that a little bit. And I read a little bit on what Walton had to say. Just doesn't seem plausible to me. Um, and so this this seems to me to be the most plausible alternative to young Earth creationism. Um, I don't know where I would rate like my percentage of like how confident I am one viewer or another. Um, I am actually very compel. Uh, I think his New Testament um, analysis of a, a, a astrotoric versus illustrious abuse. I actually think that's spot on. Um, for me, that makes a lot of sense of things like how uh, Jude quotes First Enoch. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I am also in. Uh, Huge. I, I, I am in agreement with him that I think Neanderthals are humans now. I actually did not think that um, before Craig started work, doing work on this. I thought Neanderthals were just... I, I didn't know what to make of them. Um, but now I'm convinced that they are humans. Um, and so I was convinced by the archaeological evidence that seems very compelling to me um, that uh, at least Neanderthals are humans. Um, if you go back a little bit further, I think you're just kind of getting into like... I think you're getting into a little bit more speculation, but... Um, minimally, Neanderthals are humans, um, and so I'm 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 happy with some of the parts of the book. Some of the parts, not so sure on. Um, I know you've got uh, more problems <laughs> with the book than than I have. I'm a little bit more, like I say, passive in that area. Um, but oh, oh, overall, I especially for the class, the class was well worth my money and well worth my time. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure you can agree with that. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was the best two hundred dollars I've ever spent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, one thing you said earlier, I was actually kind of surprised you said that, but I, I kind of I was thinking about this on Saturday. Was Craig kind of shying away from uh, his area of ex or his area of non expertise in science, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I got sort of a, a more general picture of him as a as how has his abilities and how he conceives of himself as someone who basically science is not my area but i'm going to take what a scientist a scientific authority that i trust who can explain it to me in a way that i can understand and i'm just going to take that and utilize it in my own thinking yeah. and that's one thing that bugs me because you know, I'm I'm a sign. I have a scientific background, and so I want to do my thinking in that in those terms, which you know that's just a you know my personal quirk thing. But like, I that's kind of what frustrates me about him sometimes is because he doesn't appear to want to do any kind of thinking about the science on his own. He's just taking it all from other sources, and you know I have a ton of things like recapitulation theory that he mentioned uh his idea that complex features can just arise naturally uh and and the idea that he need, he wants 
intervention mutations to occur when there's a single nucleotide, nucleotide mutation required, when that's the easiest to get without intervention. It's the complex features that require intervention from an intelligent design perspective, not the single nucleotide mutations, right? So, you know, Behe's edge of evolution or various versions of it is multiple protein-protein binding sites or two or more protein-protein binding sites in the same complex as, as Beyond the Edge of Evolution. That's his 2007 book. But Behe and virtually everyone else of that stripe would accept single nucleotide mutations as being able to be uh, happen naturally without intervention. And so, but Craig seems to do the exactly the opposite. And I, I just feel like that's kind of a, a thing where he has, uh, I, you know, I don't hesitate to say this because he's so brilliant, you know, but mm -hmm. it's like a lack of scientific understanding of the issues involved that, that kind of frustrates me about it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff about the mytho history thing that we didn't really get into. I, I was thinking about, you said this is the best alternative, and I'm trying to think if I actually agree with that or not. It's possible I could agree with that. My only other, the only other option that I think might be better than Craig's is the full-blooded liberal theology, theistic evolutionary interpretation. Mm. And that's the one, I've run into it a lot. Those are the people who don't care about sectioning off 1 and 11 from the rest of Genesis. They're going to go ahead and say there's mythical elements all the way through. I mean, yeah. basically, they're going to take the, the view that Craig does of 1 through 11 and basically extend it to either the whole book of Genesis or the whole Old Testament or, in some cases, even the whole Bible. Yeah. Um, and I've met people like that. And that seems to me just to be more to to be more consistent, but it's also less orthodox is the problem. Yeah, that's that's way less. Or I wouldn't want to do that. And but as a, from a pure rational perspective, as as to being consistent, it's the inconsistencies that bother me about Craig's view. So and a lot of my questions were like this, like poking at inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I just don't think that there's a switch in genre between 11 and 12 at all. And I don't think there's any textual evidence for it. And Craig actually fielded a question like that when he was on Sean McDowell's YouTube channel last month, September. Uh, you should watch that watch if that you one. haven't. You did? I think so. I don't remember all the questions on there, but if you remind me, I might, I might remember. Yeah, the one question that I remembered was when uh, it was a it was a, a girl asking a question and she asked about the the genre switch what you know i don't think there's a genre switch between 11 and 12 and craig's answer was that's not a serious objection because all the old testament commentaries section off the primeval history by itself mm -hmm. and that's what well, that was his answer and i was like that's not a good enough answer for me because First of all, in the book, he mentions that most commentators divide Genesis into three parts, if you remember that. Yep, the uh, Joseph story at the end. Yeah, yeah. And so the question for me is, why don't they switch genres between the second part and the third part? If, if a division like that is evidence of a genre switch, then why don't they switch genres there? And so to me, it's not... Like divisions like that are are just divisions in the text, like chapter divisions or divisions between verses, right? If you want to assert a genre switch, you have to appeal to more than just a, a division that commentators make. You know yeah, what I that mean? That would be an appeal to authority. Yeah, that would be a logical fallacy. I am yeah. actually, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, though, I am trying to think of some of the some of the reasons that. Well, I guess, I guess, in in one sense, I guess part of the the whole book is just an argument that Genesis one to eleven is different, but um, I'm also I'm, I'm trying to think of like some of the succinct reasons. Like, because sometimes he'll have like his his long drawn out answers, and then sometimes he'll have his succinct answers. And I can't I can't think of any off the top of my head of like of them just rattling off the reasons why the Old Testament commentators section things off. Because that's really what you'd want to know, right? You'd want to know what reasons do these Old Testament commentators 
section yeah. of Genesis 1 11. Obviously. Yeah, and the only succinct answer that he really gives is that there's a narrowing of focus in the narrative between 11 and 12. Yes, yes, and that I, is and, true. Yeah, he, he does say that. And I've argued that in, in some of the previous episodes, I've argued that there's a narrowing of focus in chapter 6 where God talks about the whole world and then suddenly he talks about Noah for four chapters. Uh, but you could maybe argue that, well, it's a global flood, so. But, you know, I, uh, what was I going to say? The Sorry. Genesis 11 <laughs> yeah, and 12 track. thing. Yeah. <laughs> the, so, the Genesis 11 and 12 thing, another, another argument that I make is that if you took the chapter 11 and as it's separate, a separate text, and then you took chapter 12 as a separate text, and you gave it to somebody who's completely uninformed about it, or about what they mean, and had no background knowledge, let's say they were an alien about, so they don't know about human nature and the long ages and stuff. Uh, if they read 11 and 12, and you told them one of them is history and one of them is myth, I'm almost certain they would pick 12 as myth and 11 as history. Because in 12, 11 is just a list. Yeah. yeah, and because in 12, it's this disembodied God talking to Abraham about, I'm going to make your name great and all that stuff. And the other thing is just people are having kids and dying, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was, oh, here was what I was going to say before, is if you were really committed to the genre analysis thing, I think what you would do is you would say that Genesis chapter 4 and 5 are historical, and you'd put a division before and after, and then you'd put another division, you'd say the flood story is mythical, starting in chapter 6, and then you'd say 10 and 11 are historical, and then you'd, you'd so you'd put a division between 3 and 4, between 5 and 6, and between 9 and 10. That's what I think would be the correct genre divisions if he was right about this. And I know that the reason he only puts a division between 11 and 12 is because he needs to include the genealogies as mythical. Right. Yeah, because otherwise the you old... have a problem with long ages. Yep. Yeah. And so to me, that's just kind of ad hoc, you know? Um, so. Well, any other uh, closing thoughts? I, I think we've, I mean, obviously, uh, hopefully the folks on your channel will be uh, familiar with, with your views if they've watched other stuff. I'm hoping as as well um for me uh your perspective has been very interesting uh, as somebody who i think has legitimately researched dr craig's position on things and is offering i, I think valid critiques of a lot of his views um i i i'm it's very refreshing to to see this because i think i think in a lot of places you treat him fairly too um and so that is really really good for me to see and so um, I, this has been a, a fun exercise whenever I like some, sometimes I think I mentioned this to you. Sometimes uh, if I, um, if I'm out walking, uh, I'll put on a podcast and so I need to find something to, to listen to. So I'll search William Lane Craig and then I'll put <laughs> on a, a filter for videos from the last week. And I remember I just happened to find you, um, by chance, uh, well before this, uh, class we, before we even met each other. Um, and, uh, we need, we need more perspectives like yours, I think um for for folks to hear um yeah where, yeah for where we sure. can say that it's not it's not just a given that modern science defeats um defeats every uh, defeats the young earth creationist model or that the young earth creationist science is just so wildly implausible that you can't even possibly like you just you, you're it's just too off the wall you can't do anything with it i i, I don't think that's the case i i, I think that you can I think you're not going to be within the scientific mainstream, but I think you could reasonably hold to the some, to what creation science teaches. Um, so I, I really appreciate your work in, in that respect, Ben. Um, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. It's good to hear. And I will be the first to admit that uh, the there's a lot of people on my side who don't have a very good attitude about this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of... Um, some of the stigma against young earth creationism is there's so many people who are, who are very unintelligent about it. Um, and, uh, and as ignorantly assertive. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I really appreciate your openness and this was really fun. Uh, we should do it again. Uh, like, I think you and I, we, we just, we communicate really well. 
So I think, th- I think this was this was good. I, I hope the audience is also able to in, enjoy some dialogue together um, with a with another partner who's at least. I mean, I wouldn't. I'm definitely no expert in this area, but I, I do feel like I mean, I've read the book. I'm somewhat informed on some of these things. So I've uh, this 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 was fun to me. Uh, thank you for having me on, Ben. Sure. All right. Well, uh, I'll let you go then, and um, I'll be back to my regularly scheduled programming next episode.